100 countries across the globe. Blood life extinct, food rations oversubscribed. In the not-too-distant future, Earth is reeling from the devastating impacts of climate change, deforestation, and a nuclear conflict, resulting in the gradual collapse of cities worldwide. The severe scarcity of power, food, and oxygen compounds the global crisis. Fast forward to the year 2067, and Australia stands as one of the few surviving bastions relying on synthetic oxygen to endure. Unfortunately, this artificial life source is tainted, leading to a widespread affliction known as the sickness. Ethan White and his closest companion, Jude, work as utility workers, laboring tirelessly to maintain the stability of the neutral reactor and restore power to the beleaguered city. Post-work, their health is routinely scrutinized by their boss due to the prevailing oxygen-related health risks. When a fellow worker is unable to fulfill his duties, Ethan steps in to cover the shift in a bid to earn additional oxygen credits. Despite this noble gesture, the boss callously dismisses the original employee. On his way home, Ethan encounters a protester advocating for the idea that access to oxygen should not be a privilege, but a universal right urging sacrifice for the sake of future generations. While most passersby remain indifferent, Ethan becomes embroiled in a confrontation with a recently fired worker, desperate to secure employment for the sake of his ailing children. Tensions escalate until their heated exchange is abruptly halted by a shocking incident, the spontaneous combustion of the protester. Later that evening, as Ethan relaxes at home, he learns from a news broadcast that the self-immolation by the protester was a commemoration of the death of the last living plant. The report highlights the escalating sickness-related deaths and the assurances from Crony Corp, the oxygen-producing company, about their commitment to finding a solution. Despite these promises, public unrest persists, fueled by fears of imminent human extinction. The news takes a personal turn when the reporter mentions the demise of Crony Corp's lead scientist, Richard, Ethan's father. Distraught, Ethan switches off the TV. Shortly after, his wife, Xanthia, arrives home and he presents her with a new oxygen mask. Amid their playful interactions, Xanthia unexpectedly vomits blood, revealing she succumbed to the sickness. Despite her reassurances, the gravity of the situation hangs heavily. In the following days, Ethan is summoned to Crony Corp's offices, with Jude accompanying him. There, they encounter Regina, the company's chief technology officer, who proposes that Ethan can play a pivotal role in saving humanity. She leads them to the lab, unveiling the Chronicle, a time machine invented by Richard two decades earlier. Crony Corp has been experimenting with it, sending a clock into the future. However, they've also transmitted radio waves and received a reply from 400 years ahead, cryptically stating, send Ethan White. Regina posits that the people in the future hold the cure for the sickness and will only share it with Ethan. The team is at a loss on how to bring Ethan back from the future, leaving him with the task of locating the individuals who sent the enigmatic message. After the meeting, Ethan and Jude head to a bar to mull over Regina's request. Struggling with the dilemma of leaving Xanthia behind versus the potential of saving her by going Ethan is torn. Jude argues that staying means witnessing Xanthia's eventual demise while going might offer a chance to save her in the years to come. When Jude brings up Richard, Ethan, still haunted by the past, asserts that he won't abandon Xanthia like his father did to him. Recalling his eighth birthday, Ethan vividly remembers waiting all day for his father, Richard, who arrived late with a peculiar box. Inside the box, Richard placed Ethan's hand, revealing that he would face a crucial choice one day. The moment turned painful as an electronic bracelet closed around Ethan's wrist, leaving him wounded. Ignoring protests from his wife, Richard left the house, an event etched in Ethan's memory. The recollection also brings back the painful memory of his mother's death. As Jude departs, Ethan contemplates his past and decides to go home to share Crony Cork's plan with Xanthia. Despite his reluctance to leave her, Xanthia urges Ethan not to use her as an excuse to avoid saving humanity and encourages him to have faith. She expresses fear for the children in her class who have succumbed to the sickness. Later that evening on the rooftop, Ethan, grappling with memories, attempts to remove the bracelet. As the haunting recollection of his mother's death resurfaces, Ethan finds solace in the memory of Jude who once shared his oxygen mask on the fateful day. In the present, Ethan's decisive scream echoes through the air as he resolves to embark on the journey. The following morning, he leaves a metal flower for Xanthi, assuring her of his return, unaware that she is actually awake and tearful. Arriving at Crony Corp's office, Ethan strikes a deal with Regina. He agrees to go into the future only if Xanthi receives the initial dose of the cure. Regina accepts, and they swiftly head to the lab. In the lab, scientists brief Ethan on how to use the special suit and the pocket computer named Archie. Jude appears to offer support, pledging to look after Xanthi in Ethan's absence. Stepping into the machine, Ethan is enveloped in electricity before being propelled into the future. Plunging through a hole in the sky, he lands in a rainforest and promptly loses consciousness. 
Upon waking, he realizes his suit is burning and hastily removes it just before it explodes. As Effin adjusts to the revitalized surroundings of clean air and abundant vegetation, he marvels at nature's resurgence. Using Archie to determine his location, Ethan encounters a challenge as the device fails to connect to satellites. Resorting to releasing a magnet into the ground, he manages to sense nearby structures and follows Archie to the closest facility. At the entrance, Ethan is taken aback to discover a skeleton with a skull puncture. The shock intensifies when he sees the skeleton wearing a suit bearing his name. A rusted Archie lies beneath the leaves and Richard's bracelet is on the skeleton's wrist. Though the bracelet's green light indicates a different outcome, signifying Richard's demise on this mission, Ethan is gripped by panic. After calming down from the initial shock, Ethan attempts to open the facility's doors without success. Instead, he prompts the rusted Archie to play the last recording. A distorted voice declares that it's better this way, ending suffering, followed by two arguing voices and a gunshot. The battery runs out, and the rusted Archie shuts down. Observing a wire wrapped around it, Ethan improvises by using wire from his suit to wrap around his own Archie, enabling her to detect a beacon signal. Following the signal through the forest, Ethan discovers two oxygen dispensers, but no signs of people. Later in the evening, Ethan struggles to start a fire with Archie's assistance and finds berries that Archie cannot identify. Tasting one, Ethan promptly drops them due to their unpleasant flavor. Seeking confirmation of the year 2474 from Archie using constellations, Ethan reminisces about stargazing with Richard. The memory abruptly ends as Richard falls ill, vomiting and hallucinating. Amid a thunderstorm, a ball of light crashes near Ethan's camp. As his hallucinations intensify, he perceives a man running towards him, poised to stab him in the chest. Ethan loses consciousness, only to wake and discover that the mysterious figure is Jude, who administered medicine to counteract the poison from the berries. The next morning, Jude explains that Crony Corp is monitoring Ethan's vitals and detected his imminent demise. They utilize the remaining power of the Chronicle to send Jude for assistance. Ethan shares the discovery of the skeleton with Jude, but Jude dismisses the notion that it could be Ethan. Continuing to use Archie to track the signal, they eventually locate another facility. The door opens instantly after scanning Ethan's eye. Inside, darkness envelops them, save for a glowing screen displaying Ethan's name. Upon pressing enter, the bracelet on Ethan's wrist activates, extracting blood for DNA analysis. Alarmed, Jude reveals he brought a gun, fearing an attack. The bracelet's green light signals Ethan's identity confirmation, prompting the computer to illuminate the room. To their astonishment, they find themselves in Crony Corp's lab, and the computer announces that the portal will open in four hours. Jude is relieved, but Ethan is concerned as his bracelet now matches the green hue of the skeletons. Examining the computer logs, Ethan discovers a holographic recording by Richard from his time at Crony Corp. Richard reveals that they buried a monitoring station designed to send data from the future once the air became breathable. In the subsequent entry, the team gears up for the anticipated reply from 2474. However, they only receive the message, send Ethan White. Regina inquires about the possibility of sending matter, but the report indicates a power problem in 2474. Abruptly, the lab system shuts down and the computer alerts Ethan to an issue with the nuclear core power. Ethan initiates a diagnosis with Archie, revealing a corrupted power feed that jeopardizes their return to 2067. The computer issues a warning that failure to rectify the problem before the countdown ends will result in a nuclear explosion. Jude rushes to locate tools, while Ethan grapples with the implications of the situation. He realizes that Chromi Corp was aware of the power failure long before informing him, and that they must have fixed the facility and discovered a cure. Ethan questions why Crony Corp withheld information about the power failure and sent Jude instead of a medic. Jude contends that he volunteered because he was the only one and tensions rise as Ethan insists on analyzing the situation before proceeding with repairs. The disagreement nearly escalates into aggression, but as Ethan steps back, Jude regains composure and urges him to recognize the gravity of the situation. Agreeing to head to the access tunnel for repairs, Ethan and Jude traverse the forest and make their way to the city only to discover it in ruins and reclaimed by nature. As they explore, they come across numerous skeletons, leading Ethan to the chilling realization that nobody survived on Earth during the year he originated from. The planet seemingly waited for humanity to perish before replenishing itself. Growing anxious, they visit Xanthi's school, where they find the students' skeletons, suggesting they died in their classrooms. Fearing mission failure without anyone to move the bodies, Ethan's worry intensifies. However, the most devastating discovery awaits them. Xanthi's skeleton, holding the metal flower. Grief overwhelms Ethan as he recalls a night when Richard called them to meet, resulting in a tragedy where a stranger killed his mother and stole Ethan's oxygen mask. 
Richard never appeared, but Jude found and rescued Ethan. The memory triggers a panic attack and Jude helps Ethan regain composure. Ethan, overwhelmed with regret for leaving Xanthi alone, believes they can't change anything. Jude consoles him, remarking that they are better off now as no one is suffering anymore. Ethan is shocked as those were the same words he heard from the rusted Archie. Playing the recording again, he realizes the argument concludes with Jude shooting him. In the present, Jude brandishes his gun, prompting Ethan to question its presence when there's nothing to fight. A heated argument ensues until Archie reminds them of the two-hour countdown to the nuclear explosion. Jude drags Ethan to the tunnels, where they discover the fried nuclear core necessitating a rerouting of power. As Ethan and Jude struggle to reroute power, their initial attempts fail, prompting the computer to initiate door closure for safety. When Ethan hears the computer mention the need for depressurization, he removes the bar blocking the door, leaving Jude outside to protect him. Activating the oxygen purge successfully restores power, but the process causes Ethan to faint. In desperation, Jude breaks the glass, allowing oxygen to flow back in to keep Ethan alive. Returning to the lab, they discover they have only 37 minutes before the portal launch. Ethan opens a door leading to his skeleton, leading him to reluctantly accept that he may not be able to change fate. While Ethan changes the batteries of the two Archies, he accuses Jude of planning to shoot him. Making the rusted Archie play the last recording the other Ethan saw, it reveals Jude threatening Ethan with a gun and urging him to fight back. Jude insists he has no intention of shooting Ethan, sparking an argument. Jude suggests staying put, but Ethan refuses to abandon everyone to their fate. Ethan forces open another door leading to the utility room but finds no masks. Despite Jude's assertion that they can't save everyone, Ethan pushes him away and goes to the computer to play a log recorded on his eighth birthday. Richard expresses regret and starts explaining a mistake he made, but the message is abruptly cut off when Jude shuts off the power. Enraged, Ethan locks Jude in the utility room and restores power to finish watching the message. Richard reveals that he did everything for his son and wanted to explain in person. He called home, asking little Ethan to take a walk with his mother to meet him. However, Regina and Jude entered the lab to corner him, exposing Regina's plan to use the Chronicle for escaping to the future with a select group, abandoning the search for a cure. In a shocking revelation, Richard refuses to cooperate with Regina, exposing that he programmed this system to be activated only by Ethan in the future. A furious Regina, claiming that humans are the real virus, pulls out a gun and inquires if it's possible to send someone to fix the power issue. Confirming the feasibility, a scientist prompts Regina to shoot Richard. Jude breaks free in an attempt to stop the recording, but he fails. The truth unfolds further as Regina admits to orchestrating the death of Ethan's mother and assigning Jude as his guardian. A devastated Ethan confronts Jude, accusing him of using him for years. An intense argument ensues over their next course of action. Ethan, determined to halt the Chronicle, starts pulling cables. In response, Jude attacks him, urging him to fight. Ethan, refusing to engage, faces Jude's gun aimed at his head, expressing his belief in his brother. Witnessing Ethan's pain triggers guilt in Jude, who apologizes and then self-deletes. In the present, Regina readies the elite route for their escape, ordering a guard to kill Ethan upon their arrival. In the future, Ethan experiences a breakdown, reaching for Jude's hand. He snaps out of it when the computer reacts to a ping sent by Regina's team, realizing that he, in the lab, is responsible for all these events. In a moment of clarity, he formulates a plan and sends the message, send Ethan white, with a purpose in mind. In the present, Regina anxiously awaits the countdown to reach zero. However, instead of a portal opening, the chronicle shuts down. Inside the machine, a gift from Ethan is discovered, comprising a collection of plants, a can, and a video documenting Richard's murder. In the future, Ethan destroys the Chronicle to ensure it is never used again. Subsequently, present-day news covers Regina's arrest, emphasizing how scientists are collaborating with the plants to initiate ecological regeneration. A Crony Corp employee delivers the can to Xanthi, revealing her name on it. Upon opening it, she tearfully discovers a real flower inside. In the future, Ethan buries Jude's body by the river, placing the metal flower on the grave. While observing a butterfly nearby, he recalls his father teaching him about the interconnectedness of everything through time. Excited about the potential changes, Ethan rushes back to the facility, only to find his skeleton missing. Eagerly, he runs through the forest to reach the city once more. This time, he discovers that humanity has not only survived but has also developed buildings harmoniously blending with nature. Make sure to subscribe it and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.